the after I had taken the uh, standard entrance exam for uh, police officers. And then we took the battery of tests. And then one day they called, three people I didn't know they were from Barcy, called me down to the old police headquarters and they asked me some questions. Uh, what I feel, what did I feel about certain things? And one of the final questions was, what did I feel about Malcolm X? And I said, uh, I didn't know that much about the man. Then they told me, we want you to go up to 125th Street and 7th Avenue around the Teresa Hotel, hang around for a while, and get your face known. And so for about a week, I hung around uh, 125th, chock full of nuts. And then um, after which, following, the following, uh, following week, they said, we want you to try to get into Malcolm's organization, which was in the Teresa Hotel. So my next visit, I go to uh, Malcolm's office in the Teresa Hotel. And I meet a, meet a fellow and express the fact that I wanted to join the organization. He gave me a questionnaire form to fill out, which I did. And then I started attending meetings. Gene Roberts, of course, identity as a guard for Malcolm, undercover guard, never came out for about six years after Malcolm's death when he was a witness doing the same kind of work in what's called the Panther 21 trial here in New York, when 21 Black Panthers were accused of plots to dynamite uh, Saks Fifth Avenue and the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens and so on. They were all acquitted after an eight-month trial, the longest trial, I think, in New York's history, criminal trial. A black person who takes a black leader and weaves his way into his confidence and then betrays him or her or any other one for that matter, is decidedly beneath contempt. So if Gene Roberts were a part of all this, the man himself is totally beneath contempt. Thank you. With Gene Roberts as a trusted bodyguard, the New York City police now had a man on the inside who could closely monitor the activities of the Muslim Mosque Incorporated, the OAAU, and the minister as well. In the cold, early morning hours of February 14, 1965, a Molotov cocktail smashed through a window of the house he shared with his pregnant wife and four young daughters. The minister and his family escaped unharmed through the flames and onto the lawn, where they saw the raging inferno destroy their home. I stood in my underwear, bare feet, in the middle of my driveway with a gun in my hand for 45 minutes waiting for the police or waiting for the fire department to come. Uh, had any threats? That's all I get is threats. I get uh, not less than six or seven threatening uh, phone calls every day. He found his family shelter at a friend's home, and the next day he flew to Detroit to keep a speaking engagement. Distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, friends and enemies, it isn't something that made me lose confidence in what I'm doing because my wife understands and I have children from this size on down and even in their young age they understand. I think they would rather have a father or a brother or whatever the situation may be who will take a stand in the face of any kind of reaction from narrow-minded people uh, rather than to co compromise and later on have to grow up in shame and in disgrace. Monday night, February 15, 1965, while he was addressing an audience at the Audubon Ballroom, a disturbance in the audience distracted his bodyguards, pulling them from their assigned posts. The dry run, as I felt it was, uh, started, I had, um, I was part of the front rostrum guards, the guards that stand in front of the stage, and to my, to my right, or directly in front of me, there was a commotion, a couple of chairs overturning. Uh, I noticed a 
individual walking down the middle of the, uh, the middle aisle. I took a couple steps toward him, and he took a seat in the second row. Elijah Muhammad uh, has given the order to his followers to see that I am crippled or killed. 